Hello viewers and welcome to a new STM32 tutorial video. Now, as I have mentioned many, many times in the previous videos, uh, I have not created a detailed plan for these videos. I am improvising as I go along and it is inevitable when doing it that way that occasionally I skip to fast over a topic that may deserve a bit more in-depth talk. And one of the things I realized is that I actually haven't talked in detail about the GPIO pins. GPIO stands for General Purpose Input Output and everything in a microcontroller like the STM32 uh, is built around those GPIO pins. So if we look at my wiki under the official documentation <coughs> and the processor that we are using, which is the STM I am using mostly is the STM32F405. If you look in that data sheet, <coughs> the <coughs> processor is built around an ARM core and then it's got a number of peripherals, timers, ADCs, DACs, UARTs, um, etc. But it also has these TPIO ports. And the GPI ports are arranged into uh, GPIO port A, B, C, D, etc., etc. How many of those are actually available depends on the packaging. Uh, some of these packages have 48 pins, some have 64. So it depends on how many pins are available. And each of these GPIO ports is addressed as a 16-bit uh, value, so you will have 16 pins uh, for each of these. Now, if we look at the actual processor that we are using, which is the uh, Quad Flatpak 64, a uh, leaded uh, Quad Flatpak, you'll see that we have PA is mostly 100% there, and PB uh, is there. There is a few PC pins, but as far as I know, not all of them. <coughs> and there is even a PD that's snug in up here. I don't know why, but uh, maybe we'll discover that later as we dive into this. Now, each of these pins have a possibility of multiple functions. And if we look in, uh, that was page 30, uh, 41. If we go down to 52, we will have the, uh, no, it's before that. Where are we? We will have the pin and ball definitions. And you can see out here that you have the pin number of the packets, and then you have the different, different packages. And as you can see, an example here, PE3, is not available on the uh, QFP64 or the WLCSP. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, are not available on these. So let's go down and find one that is available. That could, for example, be... Uh, what is A9 doing? Oh, that's... Uh, sorry. Let's go down further. PA1, for example. Let's look at PA1. And you can see in this schematic, PA1 is pin 15 of the package. So bup, 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 that will be down here. So you have PA1 down here. Um, each of these pins will have a pin name, which is the function that this is after a reset of the of the call. You'll also see that we have some S pins here, which is a power supply pin, but this pin 15 is defined as an IO pin. Then it is defined as an FT under IO structure. FT basically means five volt tolerant. And let me just have a brief look at how that is designed. Uh, five volt 
5 volt tolerant I.O. pin means that even though the MCU is running at 3.3 volt uh, supply voltage or lower actually, uh, it can accept 5 volt on the pin without sending out blue smoke. Uh, and that is because there's a couple of protection diodes in the input states. Other than that, you can see the pins will have an input driver, which is by default the one that is enabled. So it will go into a high impedance uh, Smith figure here and then it will go to alternative function input or read or whatever. If it is switched to output, uh, we have the same that we have a, a couple of MOSFETs driving the output and those MOSFETs can be configured either as a push-pull which means that the output pin is either pulled up to the supply voltage or it is pulled down to the ground level or it is open drain which basically means that the top MOSFET here is not touched at all but the lower MOSFET will open and allow a current flow into the pin and down to ground. Where were we? We were here. Now, what I really wanted to talk about this is what is known as alternate function. So each pin, where were we? We were here, PA1. By default, it is running as a GPIO input pin. It can be configured to input mode or output mode or else. But all pins, or most of the pins on an STM32 also have certain alternate functions. So you can see that <coughs> the PA1 can actually be used for UART4 as a receive pin. If you're using an Ethernet uh, peripheral uh, PHY, uh, then it can be used for that and uh, it can be used as a timer channel uh, or it can send events out. Uh, you can also see that it can be used as an input pin for the ADC, so analog to digital converter, it can be used as an analog input pin. Um, each of the pins on the, <coughs> on the STM32 are like that. It has a primary function and it has a number of alternative functions. And if we go further down in this document that was around page 50 to port 63, you actually have a table which is very interesting, which is called the alternate function mapping. And here you can see this is arranged into port A, port B, and port C and each of these we can take A1 again <coughs> have a number of alternate functions so PA1 can be configured as alternate function 1 it will be connected to timer 2 channel 2 if it is AF2 it will be connected to alternate function 2, it will be connected to timer 5 channel 2, uh, or if it is alternate function, where was it, where was that line, uh, 8, it will be connected as the receipt pin on UART, and so on and so forth. Now, this is all quite complicated, obviously, uh, fortunately, in our case, we are not programming this manually, but we are using STM32 Cube MX. And when you in Cube MX click on a, we can use this PA1 again, click on one of the pins, you get a list of all these alternate functions that can be configured ADC, channel one, uh, timer two, timer five, channel two. You are receive, uh, configure this, and you can see they can be configured as a GPIO input, which is pretty much default, or GPIO output, or a GPIO analog. Finally, it can also generate an interrupt, that is the external interrupt 1. Or is it 11? No, it's 1. 
So, when we are generating code in STM32 cube MX, it will generate a file down under core source, which is called STM32F4HELLMSP. MSP is short for MCU support packets. Uh, so, in this MCU support packets, it's basically configure the MCU in the way that is necessary to run the hell libraries. And if we can see down, if we look down here, we can see, for example, for this one, the timer, we'll see that in our case, we had four timer channels up here, timer one, uh, four channel one, two, three, and four. And these are all defined down here, TBIO six, seven, eight, and nine on port B. So B six, seven, eight, nine uh, is configured as a push pull. There is no pull up or pull down. And the alternate function is AF two. So let's look at PB six AF two in the data sheet. So P B6 is there. Alternate function 2 is, as is suspected, timer for channel 1. So most of the time, if you're using STM32 CubeMX or HAL, uh, we don't need to worry about the, these things uh, very much. Uh, but it's still I think important to know this. Let's look at a few more details. If we look at, for example, the LED pin here, we have configured that to a GPIO output, which is... So up here under GPIO, we have PC13, which, and each of these GPIO have some settings inside uh, under system core GPIO. We can see GPIO output level, that is <coughs> whether it's high or low, after a MCU reset, the GPIO mode, which can be either push-pull or open drain, and pull up, pull down, whether we should enable a pull up resistor or pull down resistor, you can't enable both, that would be silly. Uh, I have never really figured out what the output speed uh, means. Uh, or what it is changing, uh, to be exact. I can guess what it means, but I, I don't know exactly why it is there. Uh, that's about it. Now, briefly about the output push-pull or open drain. Uh, if we look at, let's go back to our STM32 Viki and let's look at a random design that I have made at some point, we can look at the green pill uh, that is here. Open image and new tab and zoom in a bit. You will see that I have some LEDs somewhere there. You'll see I have a blue LED and it's connected directly to 3.3 volt and then it goes to a current limiting resistor and straight into PC13. Now, this setup where you supply a voltage to something and then go to something into a GPIO pin, this is where open drain is used. So if PC13 is configured in open drain mode, it won't do anything when it's high. It will just be high impedance, so no current flows through here. But it can go low, and that means that the current flow. Now, you will see this design pattern in many, many different boards. And uh, I am actually not sure exactly why it's done. I mean, you could easily just take PC13 in push-pull mode and just drive it through a resistor, through the LED and down to ground, for example. Um, but it is rarely done that way. It's mostly done this way. I have heard, but I have not verified it, that this is a historical thing. Uh, electronic engineers tend to stick with what they're used to. And 
in the olden days, some of the early MCUs were able of sinking more current. That means you could have more current running into it than running out of it. Uh, and that is why you see this pattern very, very often. Um, on an STM32, it really doesn't matter. It can supply the same uh, current as it can sink, uh, which in all cases is about 20 milliamps per pin. So it really shouldn't matter. But it's something to be aware of. Uh, in this case, PC13 should actually be configured as a open drain pin and not a push-pull. Push-pull, it can be a push-pull as well, it doesn't. In this particular case, it doesn't really matter all that much. Uh, it will matter more if we had like a button uh, where we need the internal push-pull, uh, pull-up resistor to pull the button high and then you press the button, it shorts the ground, then it could be, it could matter how you configure this. But in this case, it doesn't matter. So that is about all I had uh, intended to do. I hope this uh, relatively short video uh, gives you more of an idea about how the GPIOs on an STM32 actually functions. It's not something you need to know in detail, uh, but it is, I think, very important to know where you can find these things in the data sheet so you can look it up if you have a problem. Uh, and where you can find the data sheet instead. Uh, oops, I zoomed in on that image. Uh, and I try to link all um, the official documents in STM32, official documentation. There is the data sheet for the STM32 F103, 407, 405, 411, and etc. etc. Uh, this list is of course far from complete but it includes everything i have ever <coughs> spent a significant amount of time on as usual please do like and subscribe it helps the channel a lot and it motivates me to make more videos um, uh, and i read all comments and i try to reply so if you have any questions or comments please put them down below in the comment section and um, have a wonderful rest of the day.